On April 14, 1775, British General Thomas Gage received orders to quash the rebellion, disband the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, and arrest resistance leaders, notably Samuel Adams and John Hancock. This dismayed Gage, for he knew that any attempt to arrest colonial leadership or disband their assemblies would trigger riots, if not open rebellion. Unwilling to simply refuse orders, Gage instead elected to use his granted discretion to modify the mission. Rather than a campaign to root out the rebellion, for which there weren't enough soldiers in all the Americas, he would instead disarm the militia via a swift raid. He hoped removing their ability to fight would sap their will to revolt and put an end to Massachusetts's defiance. He was wrong. Welcome to our second video on the American Revolution, where the British and Continental armies will clash at the Battle of Bunker Hill. This video was sponsored by our kind YouTube members and patrons. Becoming a YouTube member or patron is the best way to support our work, so we're now providing our supporters with exclusive videos to thank them. Join their ranks to watch the Pacific War series, alongside the First Punic War, Sulla's biography, the Italian War of Unification, Risorgimento, the Russo-Japanese War, Albigensian Crusade, History of Prussia, and much more. 80 or so exclusive videos in total. In 2024, YouTube members and patrons will watch series on the Fall of Sparta, the Reconquista, Second Punic War, Spanish War of Succession, and Russian Civil War, and will continue getting early access to all videos, access to an exclusive Discord server, will know our schedule, and vote on future videos. YouTube member and patron support allows us to keep the majority of our videos free in a world where YouTube monetization income is very uneven. If you want to support our work, join their ranks today via the link in the description and pinned comment. Thank you! On the evening of April 18th, General Gage gathered his officers and informed them of the operation. 700 infantry, consisting of a vanguard of elite light infantry, and the main body of grenadiers would cross the Mystic River by boat, then march 17 miles to Concord, destroy all military supplies, and return. Mounted patrols had already been dispatched to scout the area and set roadblocks. Unfortunately for Gage, the Sons of Liberty discovered his intentions almost immediately, and Dr. Joseph Warren dispatched Paul Revere and William Dawes to spread the alarm. Dawes went south via the Boston Neck, while Revere rode north across the Mystic. The two men met up just outside Cambridge and continued to Lexington to warn both the local militia and Adams and Hancock, who were hiding in the village. Messengers were then sent out to alert neighboring towns to turn out their militia. After the message was delivered, Dawes and Revere continued on to Concord, joined by resident Dr. Samuel Prescott. Unfortunately, the men ran into a British roadblock. Revere was captured, but Dawes and Prescott fled into the woods. Dawes fell from his horse, but Prescott successfully made it to Concord around 3 a.m. By now, militia companies all over Massachusetts were marshalling toward Concord. By the time the British regulars completed their crossing and began their march at 2 a.m. on the 19th, their mission was effectively a failure. All usable stores were removed from Concord within a few hours of Prescott's arrival, and only a few bags of old musket balls and three 24-pounder siege cannons, too heavy to move on broken gun mounts, remained. The vanguard arrived in Lexington around 5 a.m. to find 80 militia assembled on the village green, but not blocking the road. Instead of marching past, the soldiers moved onto the green in front of the militia to prevent a flank attack. The two sides simply stared at each other while a British officer started ordering the militia to disperse. Then a shot rang out. No one knows who fired the shot heard around the world, but the British regulars responded to it by firing a volley and charging the Continental Line. By the time Major Pitcairn regained control of his soldiers, eight militiamen lay dead on the green. With little other choice, the British column continued on to Concord, as news of Lexington spread. Knowing they were outnumbered, the 250 militiamen already in Concord retreated across the North Bridge to await more reinforcements, allowing the British to search the empty town. After destroying the cannon's mounting points, the regulars threw the musket balls into a pond and burned the gun carriages. As the smoke from the fire rose, the militia moved back towards the bridge, now numbering 400. The British Light Company holding the bridge retreated across and formed defensive positions, and another standoff ensued. Then a shot was fired from the British side. 
Again, this set off the regulars, who fired off a volley without orders. But unlike at Lexington, this time the militia returned fire. The regulars' leadership, leading from the front, quickly went down, and the leaderless and exhausted soldiers fled back towards an oncoming relief column. The militia then pulled back and allowed the relief force to recover their wounded. By 11.30, the search was complete, and the order to return to Boston was given. However, the countryside was now swarming with nearly 2,000 outraged militiamen. As the British column marched back, militiamen ambushed them from every bush, fence, wall and tree, ultimately causing around 300 casualties. By the afternoon of the 19th, the British met with reinforcements and escaped into Boston, while still growing militia forces made camp outside. Boston was now under siege by rebel forces, as the militia force swelled to 4,000. With Gage's worst fears having become a reality, the mild general characteristically tried to defuse the situation by appeasing both sides, playing at being both Britain's general and Massachusetts's civilian governor. On the civil side, Gage refused to impose martial law or take any action against opposition newspapers and leaders, instead crafting a deal with city aldermen to surrender any remaining personal weapons in exchange for safe passage out of Boston. On the military side, Gage immediately began building fortifications on the Boston Neck and sent reinforcements to Charlestown to fortify the heights, which would ultimately be abandoned after Gage decided to tighten his lines. Next, he sent orders to the remaining garrisons in Canada to send surplus troops to reinforce him in Boston, then dispatched requests to London for reinforcements. Unbeknownst to Gage, the request was superfluous. A British force of 4,500, led by Major Generals William Howe, John Burgoyne and George Clinton, had been dispatched to Boston along with a Royal Navy squadron in March. London had intended to send the force alongside delivering Gage his initial orders to crush the rebellion, but it had been delayed, first by difficulties putting the troops together and then finding officers to lead them. Howe was ill fit for command, but he was the most senior general willing to do so. Every general above him was either too old to go to America or too opposed to Prime Minister Lord North's policies. Like others among British military brass, Howe was no fan of the Prime Minister. However, his sense of duty trumped personal attachment, and when asked by King George III, he accepted the command. By the morning of April 20th, approximately 16,000 members of the Massachusetts militia, now commanded by Massachusetts's Commander-in-Chief, Major General Artemis Ward, were loosely assembled in the hills surrounding Boston. As news of the bloodshed at Lexington and Concord spread, more began marching towards Boston from New Hampshire, Rhode Island and Connecticut, who would ultimately also fall under Ward's command. British warships in Boston Harbor made a direct attack on the city impossible so Ward prepared to besiege the city, while asking around for cannons and his objective. He, like everyone else, was mainly concerned with, what now? That answer would come from all over. The Provincial Congress was willing to fight, but knew it couldn't alone. To preempt Gage's official report, it gathered sworn testimony on the events of Lexington and Concord from eyewitnesses, militiamen and British prisoners. These descriptions of the battle were sent both to the other colonies and to London via a fast ship, beating Gage's report by two weeks. Given by sympathetic officials to London's papers, the reports garnered more sympathy and support for the colonial cause. Gage's clinical and vague report, in comparison, would not engender much endearment towards the British government. The propaganda effort was most effective in the colonies themselves. Prior to Lexington, public opinion was relatively evenly divided between the anti-Parliament patriots and pro-Parliament loyalists. The blood shed on Lexington Green caused many moderate loyalists to change sides. In turn, legislatures began stripping royal governors of their powers or outright expelling them. However, the question of what to do was too vexing for any one colony to answer. Thus, the Continental Congress was reconvened earlier than planned. Word was sent out in late April to meet in Philadelphia, but it would take time to gather the delegates. Independently, a long escalating conflict between Virginia's royal governor, Lord Dunmore, and the legislative House of Burgesses had boiled over. After years of mutual antagonism, on April 20th, 
Dunmore handed over the Williamsburg magazine to Royal Marines from HMS Magdalen. Militia, particularly the Hanover militia led by Patrick Henry, responded by first trying to stop the handover and then marching on Williamsburg. Dunmore would flee, first to his hunting lodge and then be driven from Virginia to the safety of the Royal Navy. Meanwhile, a young captain in the Connecticut militia named Benedict Arnold, having received word to march for Boston, wrote to the Connecticut Committee of Correspondence that as of his visit the year before, Fort Ticonderoga was undermanned with plentiful stores of gunpowder and cannons. The committee immediately dispatched recruiters north to take the fort, raising militia on the road. Unaware of these developments, Arnold arrived outside Boston and told their committee of safety the same thing. On May 3rd, Massachusetts commissioned him a colonel, assigned him recruiters and funds, and gave him orders to recruit militia and take the fort. Arriving in Castleton on the border between Massachusetts and the New Hampshire Grants, Arnold learned that some of the Connecticut recruits and the Green Mountain Boys, local militia led by Ethan Allen, were already preparing to take Ticonderoga. Determined to take the fort himself, Arnold raced ahead to meet with Allen, using his official commission to claim leadership of the expedition. While the only authority Ethan Allen recognized was his own, he at least paid lip service to Arnold's claim, mostly because time was of the essence. Scouting reports on May 7th had shown how unprepared Ticonderoga was to withstand a continental siege, but British reinforcements were expected to shore up the fort's defenses soon. The time to attack was now, without Arnold's recruits. At 11.30pm on May 9th, Allen's 160 men moved into position across Lake Champlain from Ticonderoga, with the intention to attack at midnight. However, the boats didn't arrive until 1.30 am, and there weren't enough for all the men. Fearful of losing the element of surprise, Allen and Arnold ordered the attack with the men already ashore. The only sentry on duty ran away, and the fort was taken. Over the next few weeks, up to 400 militiamen would arrive to garrison the fort, although Arnold's control over them was tenuous at best. That same day, the Second Continental Congress convened, its powers and objectives unclear. The congressional delegates had been authorized by their home legislatures to discuss and plan a coordinated response to British actions. But what that meant and how much authority Congress had was entirely undefined and left for the delegates to figure out. Deciding on their course of action and what resources were available would be their second order of business. The first was to gather more allies. Only 12 colonies had attended the first congress, and the second hoped it could induce more to join the cause. Letters were immediately sent to Georgia and the Canadian and Caribbean colonies, inviting them to endorse and join the congress. Any response would take time to receive, so congress busied itself figuring out what it was actually doing. After a month of debate, Congress finally agreed that war was upon them and that it would have to fight. To do this required an army, and fortunately there was already one in existence around Boston. Thus, on June 14th, Congress decreed the formation of the Army of the United Colonies, consisting of the militia units in the Boston area. The next day, acting on John Adams's recommendation, Virginia delegate George Washington was selected to serve as its general and commander-in-chief with Dr. Warren made his second in command. Washington had little idea what situation he'd just signed up for, and no one knew that the newly formed army's first test would arrive before it was technically formed. Generals Gage and Ward had spent the rest of April and May staring at each other while trying to find supplies for their soldiers. Ward had particular difficulties, as the New England militia he commanded had marched out with few provisions, expecting a quick confrontation before returning home. Having not bargained on a siege, many lacked even basic necessities. Thus, many companies simply went home to restock. Throughout May, companies trickled in and out of the camps without notice. Discipline and chain of command beyond the individual militia company was virtually non-existent. Even if Ward had the supplies and strategic opportunity for an operation against Gage, he didn't know what troops were available or if they'd follow orders. Similarly, Gage was hampered by a lack of troops and supplies. The Royal Navy's presence ensured that no attack across the harbour or Boston Neck would succeed, but he was so heavily outnumbered 
and low on gunpowder that he couldn't risk leaving Boston. He'd even given orders to abandon partially complete fortifications in Charleston and other outlying outposts to keep his lines as tight as possible. His supply line via the ocean was open, but the nearest guaranteed source was the garrison in Halifax, Nova Scotia. That said, Gage's supply problem would be alleviated first, thereby giving him the strategic initiative. Howe's reinforcements, supplies and additional warships trickled in over the course of May. Howe, Burgoyne and Clinton didn't arrive until May 25th. With the effective force now up to 6,000, Gage began planning to break out of Boston. By June 12th, he and the generals had agreed on a plan. They would seize the Dorchester Neck, then fortify the heights to use as a staging ground to sweep the militia from Roxbury. Once that was accomplished, a second attack would retake Charlestown, then a pincer attack would drive the rebels from Cambridge. The attack was scheduled to begin on June 18th. However, Gage's plans were once again immediately leaked. On June 13th, New Hampshire's Committee of Safety warned Massachusetts of Gage's intentions. Realizing the danger, Ward directed his second-in-command, General Israel Putnam, to fortify the heights above Charlestown. On the night of June 16th, Colonel William Prescott led 1,200 militia across the Charlestown Neck to begin expanding and improving the abandoned British fortifications on Bunker Hill. However, it became apparent that Breed's Hill was the better artillery position, so he began constructing the primary redoubt there. The British quickly noticed the work, but General Clinton failed to convince the other generals to prepare an attack at dawn. The only response came from HMS Lively at 4am. However, Admiral Samuel Graves, irritated that unauthorized fire had woken him from his sleep, ordered it to stop. Once the sun rose, Gage finally realized the situation he was in. He ordered a bombardment of Breed's Hill by all the warships and a battery in Boston. The bombardment was completely ineffective, as the fortifications were too high up the hill for the warships, and too far for the Boston batteries to reliably hit. A ground assault would be needed. Meanwhile, Prescott had realized that Breed's Hill could be easily flanked. Short of troops, he ordered breastworks built on the hill's more vulnerable east side, hoping the steepness of the west side was enough protection. Sharpshooters were stationed in Charlestown to scout and oppose any landing. A dawn attack was now impossible, so General Clinton advocated for the Navy to sweep the militia from Charlestown Neck before landing troops to seize and fortify it, thus trapping and starving out the defenders on the hills. This idea was disregarded by the other generals for breaking conventional wisdom and placing their forces between two armies. Howard Burgoyne further believed that the militia would never stand against real soldiers, Burgoyne boasting that the untrained rabble would simply rout when presented with trained troops. Instead, Howe would lead 1,500 grenadiers and light infantry to land near Moulton's Hill, then sweep around the redoubt's left flank and attack from the rear, while a diversionary attack of 1,000 would land at Charlestown and feint a direct assault on the redoubt. Major Pitcairn would command a reserve force of Royal Marines. This force wasn't assembled to cross the Charles until midday. By 2 p.m., Howe's assault force was across and ready, but he held back from attacking to request reinforcements and allow his troops to eat. Seeing the British preparations, Colonel Prescott called for reinforcements. Howe's delay allowed them to arrive. Several companies of Connecticut and later New Hampshire militia responded and were positioned behind a dirt and rail wall on the mystic side. When low tide opened a gap, the wall was extended down the beach. Scattered groups of militia would continue to arrive prior to and during the battle. Among them was Dr. Warren, who'd refused to serve as an officer and insisted on being in the front line of infantry. Confusion reigned as Prescott and Putnam had difficulty getting the various militia companies to follow orders. The battle started at 3 p.m. once Howe received his reinforcements. The main column had been under fire from sharpshooters for some time before naval cannon fire set the town on fire, with the resulting pillars of smoke partially obscuring the hill. Howe's troops moved forward toward the wall, while his light infantry moved onto the beach, and his grenadiers advanced through the fields. 
unseen obstacles in the unmowed fields slowed the grenadiers' advance, leading the light column to make first contact. The militia volley fired at 50 paces, utterly shattering the surprised light companies, which fled the field with heavy casualties. The grenadiers fired a volley at the wall before charging with bayonets, only to suffer the same fate. The diversion column moved into musket range to suppress the redoubt, but suffered like the grenadiers, compelling Brigadier Pigot to order a retreat. Howe reformed his troops, called in the reserves, and attacked again, this time at the breastwork rather than the wall, while Pigot launched a full frontal assault on the redoubt. Major Pitcairn took four wounds and died leading the charge. This did not change the result, and the British fell back in disarray. On the colonial side, General Putnam continued to try to send reinforcements and resupply from Bunker to Breed's Hill, but his orders were continually ignored or misunderstood. Many continental militiamen were deserting the battle, and there were now no more than 800 troops on the peninsula, with 150 in the redoubt. General Clinton now personally led reinforcements across the Charles River to help Howell. After evacuating the severely wounded and reforming the walking wounded, Clinton joined Howe, who resolved to concentrate the attack on the redoubt, this time using assault columns and bayonets only. At this point, the militia were almost out of ammunition and lacked bayonets. As the columns advanced, the redoubt's defenders expended their ammunition and began retreating. Colonel Prescott was among the last to retreat from the parapet, urging the men to keep fighting while knocking away bayonet thrusts with his ceremonial sword. One of the last men killed was Dr. Warren via a single shot to the head. By 5 p.m., the surviving militia had retreated in good order across the neck to Cambridge. The British were stunned by the battle, and further offensive operations were called off. On his Pyrrhic triumph, Clinton wrote, A dearly bought victory. Another such would have ruined us. The British had won the battle, but at the cost of losing any chance to change the strategic situation. It was now painfully clear that they'd underestimated the Americans, and that this war would be much harder than anticipated. On the American side, morale was high after the battle. Most of the units that were going to desert the army did before the end of the battle. Those that remained were even more determined to fight. Washington would arrive on July 2nd, finding willing but undisciplined companies. After reorganizing his command staff to replace Dr. Warren and other fallen leaders, he would embark on the arduous task of turning the militia companies into real soldiers. A harsh regime of teaching strict discipline, constant drill, and basic soldiering ensued. More pressingly, he needed heavy artillery and tasked Henry Knox with retrieving the cannons captured at Ticonderoga. While Congress was encouraged by the news from Boston, more problems had arisen. Sir Guy Carlton, the governor of Quebec, was rebuilding abandoned border forts and was entreating with the Iroquois Confederacy to raid Upper New York. This required a response, and on June 27th, it authorized what would become an invasion of Quebec. In early July, Georgia finally signed onto the Continental Congress and sent a delegation. On July 5th, Congress adopted the Olive Branch petition to King George III as a last chance to avoid war. On July 6th, the Congress issued the declaration of the causes and necessity of taking up arms. The two together made the case that the dispute was of loyal subjects of the Crown protecting themselves against a hostile Parliament. It was unsuccessful. Gage's official report on Bunker Hill reached London on July 20th and caused an uproar. Lord North had Gage's recall issued on the 23rd, as both his and the King's positions hardened. King George resolved to crush this rebellion. The Olive Branch petition was received on August 21st, but was ignored, and on the 23rd, King George issued the Proclamation of Rebellion. This war would be fought to the bitter end. In our upcoming episodes on the War of American Revolution, we will explore how this bitter struggle between Redcoat and Continental will unfold. To ensure you don't miss that, make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently, we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member-exclusive content. 
Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.